Welcome back to Orthodox Egoini Beach and we are here with OCP interviews. Today we are having His Eminence, Metropolitan Anthony of Department of Exchange Relations of Moscow Vitria Gate with us for the interview. Welcome Metropolitan. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, since you were appointed at, as uh, the Chairman of Department of Exchange Relations on uh, June 7, 2022, uh, we have seen your visits to Coptic Orthodox Pope, uh, Armenian Orthodox community in uh, Russia and even the Armenian Catholicos. Uh, then we have also witnessed your numerous visits to Malangara and also you were hosting uh, Ethiopian delegation in Moscow. So as an organization that stands for Pan-Orthodox Unity, uh, we would like to know your thoughts on future of connections between Byzantine Orthodox Churches and the Oriental Orthodox Churches. The Department for External Church Relations of the Patriarchate of Moscow, which is the oldest and the biggest department of our church, is also, together with the other tasks that we have, promoting a dialogue with the Christians which belong to different traditions. And one of the important dimensions of this dialogue is our dialogue with the Oriental Orthodox Churches. And you are right, since I became the president of the department, I paid several visits, you, you have mentioned them, and uh, I continue to do that. Because I believe, and this is my response to, uh, to your answer, if we speak about the future of this dialogue, I believe that this dialogue is very much needed nowadays. And it's needed because the world needs to hear the voice of Christians talking about important issues and expressing their own attitude uh, to what is going on. This is uh, something that we have as a task from the Lord, because he saying goodbye to his disciples, to the apostles, uh, he told them to be witnesses of him in the current world. Now we see that the world, unfortunately, is changing its attitude to Christianity. We see that Christian, Christians are being persecuted, that uh, the high moral ideals which Christianity has always proclaimed, they, uh, they are now being cancelled, I would say, in, in the current world. That's why Christians, despite the fact that they are different, that they belong to different traditions, they have sometimes different views. They have, uh, using this dialogue, they have to find what they have in common in order to bring the message of Christi Christianity to the current world. This is very much needed and uh, I believe that uh, this dialogue that we are promoting it has a great future. We have so many things to do in common, we have to, so many things to say in common. So, uh, on behalf of the Russian Orthodox Church, I would like to say that we will do our best to continue and to work together with Christians of different traditions uh, in order to bring the message of the Gospel uh, to the world. Uh, uh, since uh, the early 2000s, we have, like, more specifically from 2022, we have all seen that the Russian Church and the Russian, the Russia as a nation is being attacked by numerous propagandas. These propagandas includes propagandas against hierarchs. This includes propagandas against the church, uh, the department, and all its activities. Um, as the member of uh, Permanent Synod of Holy Synod, and as the chairman of Department of Action and Church Relations, uh, I'd like to know your response uh, to such propaganda that is really pulling out the church uh, against uh, the current situation. Our response is very simple. We continue to do whatever we are called to do as Christians in order to provide our mission uh, in the current world despite all the problems that our church is facing. We have to bear in mind one important issue that uh, the history of the Russian Orthodox Church, especially uh, in the 20th century, is a very tragic history. Yeah. Not myself, I'm still quite a young bishop, but my parents remember uh, the time when one of the Soviet leaders has promised publicly on TV to show on TV the last living Orthodox priest in our country. Uh, our predecessors remember the times when the church had been exploded, when the priests had been brought to prison, and many people believed that the church was not going to survive. Of course, one of, these uh, of the dimensions of this tragedy of the atheistic state against our church was propaganda. If you take the old books of those times and you see what they write and they speak about, about the church, you will not be surprised to hear what they say about our church now. 
uh, we have lived through these times. Our church has survived, and we know that it will survive despite all, all the ter terrible circumstances that might arrive. We know this not because we understand that we as human beings, we are so strong. No, we are weak, of course, as every human person, but we have uh, this beautiful promise of our Lord Jesus Christ who said that church will survive and the gates of hell will never uh, uh, conquer it. So uh, we know that uh, what we do, we do as Christians, we continue our ministry, we continue to preach the gospel of Christ, and uh, we don't pay much attention to that propaganda that you've mentioned. At the same time, we have also seen uh, your initiatives in United Nations Security Council um, for those Christians who are persecuted in Ukraine. Uh, we are daily receiving news from hierarchs, from uh, churches and from monasteries about persecution that's continuing in Ukraine. Um, will you please help our viewers to know more about the level of persecutions against the faithfuls and how Russian Orthodox Church is acting to it? Well, you've touched a very sensitive uh, and painful issue because um, the situation that is taking place uh, in Ukraine regarding the uh, Orthodox Church there is a tragedy and it has so many things in common with the persecutions that we've spoken just before when we sp talked about the times of the Soviet Union. I think, you know, uh, the Christians uh, who lived in, uh, in the Soviet state uh, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, they've been reading uh, the books which describe the martyrdom of the first martyrs of the first centuries of the life of Christ and admiring this uh, suffering of the martyrs, they thought that this would never happen again. Unfortunately, it happened. Then when the church in our country has got freedom, uh, when the persecution was over, most of the people thought that it would never come again. But what we see now in Ukraine is a continuation of the efforts uh, of the enemy of our salvation to make as many problems as possible to the people who want to express their faith and who want to go to the church uh, to belong to the Orthodox faith. Uh, I, I'm afraid that my answer will be a little bit long, but in order to understand what's going on in Ukraine, we have to to take a look in the history. Uh, all the things that happened uh, and that happen now is a result of the politicians trying to use the most intimate and the most sacred for every person feeling their faith, try to use the faith in their, uh, sorry to say this, dirty aims. When Ukraine has become an independent country uh, in 1990s, uh, the leaders of the country have proclaimed the idea that an independent state has to have an independent church. One of the hierarchs of the Metropolitans of the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine, who was supposed to become the next patriarch but failed after the election and took the less possible number of the votes, uh, he was used by the government. He proclaimed himself patriarch of a, a so-called independent Ukrainian church. Nobody in the Orthodox world recognized him. No other local Orthodox church recognized him as patriarch. And uh, uh, the Supreme Court, the Bishop's Court of the Russian Orthodox Church, has defrocked this ex-metropolitan and made him a layman. He did not stop. Uh, with the support of the Ukrainian government, he continued ordaining so-called bishops, ordaining so-called priests. But he did not succeed because whatever he could do with the support of the government, he did. He took the churches, uh, he tried uh, to use all the other political opportunities to attract people to his so-called church, but people did not follow him. And the majority of the faithful, they remained in the canonical church. Then recently, uh, uh, in, in the last years, uh, the new government of Ukraine tried to give, as we say, a second life to these attempts to create a new so-called independent church, which would be Ukrainian with no connections to the Moscow Patriarchate. And I have to say that the church in Ukraine has this connection with the Moscow Patriarchate, but it's a connection of a canonical order. 
the Patriarch of Moscow affirms, confirms the election of the primate of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. In all the other aspects, the Church in Ukraine is fully independent. They elect their bishops, they resolve all the issues that they have by, their, by them own. Uh, so, uh, uh, the government of Ukraine has decided to create a new so-called independent church, which would be somehow uh, supported by the other local Orthodox churches. And there, uh, they found a person who wanted to help them. It was, the, unfortunately, the ecumenical patriarch, who has decided, without any consultations with the other Orthodox churches, which are, as you know, a family of the Orthodox churches, where all the primates are equal, but the patriarch of Constantinople is the one who is equal who is the first among equals, and he has a privilege and a responsibility to provide the unity within the Orthodox family. Patriarch Bartholomew, unfortunately, did not do that. He supported the Ukrainian government, and he recognized so-called bishops and so-called priests ordained by the ex-metropolitan Philaret, about whom I spoke before, uh, ordained being a layman, so he accepted them as bishops and priests. We, uh, as Orthodox, we believe that every schism is, first of all, a sin. And we know that a sin can be healed by only one means, by confession, by repentance. It is impossible to heal an ill person saying, no, no, you are fine, just don't worry, you are okay. It's not healing, uh, it's something else. So what B Patriarch Bartholomew do, he just recognized these uh, bishops, uh, so-called bishops, so-called priests, and proclaimed uh, the beginning of the new U Ukrainian Orthodox Church, independent from Moscow, independent from any other country. But the church, which also did not have support, it had the support of the government, but it didn't have support of the people. Now, after the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, uh, the current Ukrainian government puts lots of efforts in order to support this so-called church uh, and to limit as much as possible the presence of the canonical Orthodox Church uh, in Ukraine. Uh, what they do now is uh, they take our churches, take them absolutely illegally. You can see so many videos on the YouTube where you find parish praying together, then you see two or three buses with the people whom nobody knows them. They come with weapons, they enter the church, they even don't know how to behave in the church. They do not know how to make the sign of the cross uh, they don't take off their hats. They enter, they throw away the people from the church, they throw away the priest, they change uh, the keys, and they say, this church is now ours. This is how they have taken hundreds, hundreds of churches, which after that become empty, and the, the, the people who have been thrown away from this church, they continue praying in the streets, in the forests, almost like the first Christians during the times of persecution. The response of the government is very easy. If you want to keep your church, if you want to continue going to your parish, join the schismatics. Bishops are now being persecuted. We have several bishops put in prison only due to the fact that when the secret services entered their houses, they found Christmas cards from Patriarch Kirill. They found books saying about the schism and saying against this so-called uncanonical church. For this, they have been put to prison. Several bishops have been deprived from their citizenship, despite the fact that the constitution of Ukraine prohibits this. We see terrible pictures uh, from the monastery, which is the heart of the Russian Orthodoxy, the kievo Pechersky Lavra, which has been given by the government to the schismatics, and it becomes empty. People are praying outside the Lavra, and taking Holy Communion through the fence, the metal fence, with the priest standing behind it. What we now try to do is to make the world see what is going on in Ukraine. For this we are not speaking, for this we are shouting. Our Patriarch has sent so many letters to the primates of the other Orthodox churches, uh, to Pope Francis, to heads of uh, other Christian denominations, to United Nations General Secretary, to human rights organization, asking them to pay attention to the fact that 
in Ukraine, we have a discrimination of a certain religious group only due to the fact that they belong to this group, which is actually a violence against all, all the freedoms that a person can have. First of all, it's the freedom to express your faith. We get responses. Some of them are very positive, and uh, those who receive these letters, they speak in the support of the church in Ukraine, the canonical church. We are very much moved by the attitude of the Malankara Orthodox Church, which, su which supports us and uh, shares our, our concern on what is going on. Uh, those who have the responsibility to protect human rights, unfortunately, mostly remain silent, or they just say, thank you for the information you have provided. They are now more concerned about the other rights of, hum of, of the people, uh, rights to uh, proclaim uh, same-sex marriages and so on. This is what, what they care of. But unfortunately, they do don't care of the obvious fact of the persecution of millions of Christians in Ukraine. Uh, I had uh, a chance, uh, which was a very important chance, I believe, to address the United Nations Security Council. Uh, we had a meeting uh, called by the Russian Federation in order to discuss uh, the things that are going on in Ukraine. Uh, I made a speech and it was my uh, choice not to speak about all the canonical issues which might not be uh, very clear to, to the diplomats, to the high representatives of the countries present in the United Nations Security Council. I decided just to speak about the laws, international laws and Ukrainian laws violated by the current Ukrainian government. Uh, I was prepared for the discussion that might have taken place. Uh, I, for several days I prepared myself with lots of information that could be useful for the members of the Security Council. But unfortunately, what I have seen after I finished my speech is that the, most of the members of the Security Council, after I finished, and they definitely knew the topic we were going to discuss, they just took prepared some papers prepared in advance and started talking about different issues, about everything but the problems of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Despite the fact that uh, most of those who were present, they remained deaf, I would say, they did not react to what I said. I think it was important because we could attract the attention of the world society to what is going on in Ukraine. And we will continue to do that, despite the fact whether they want to react or not. We believe that it's important that the world would know the truth and the world would speak in order to support the rights of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine to belong to the church they want to belong to, to go to, to the parish, to the priest that they know and they love. We will do our best and we hope that God will hear our prayers and see our efforts and will help our church in Ukraine to survive in these difficult times. Uh, something similar to this was seen from Estonia when Metropolitan Eugen of Tallinn and all Estonia was uh, forcefully deported from Estonia. Uh, as considering the issues in Ukraine and the Estonia, uh, my question is, how can people, Orthodox believers around the world, support the church, support and show their voice against this type of political propaganda that is, uh, that is really making scars inside the church? Uh, the problems uh, in Estonia that, that you've mentioned are unfortunately not, not the only ones. Uh, we recently had another example of our priest who served in the Russian church in the very heart of Sofia in Bulgaria, mm -hmm. in the church with, which is actually a monument which has been built to honor Russian soldiers who died in Bulgaria for the independence of this country during the war. Uh, this priest has been called to the police, which told him that his presence in Bulgaria together with his vice priest and the driver, who were the only Russians, in this parish that it creates danger for the security of the Bulgaria state. We still don't know what kind of danger can a priest uh, cause for the security of the state, so he was just, they, they put them in the car, they brought him to the border and told him to go away. Almost the same but in a different manner happened with Metropolitan Evgeny in Estonia, who has been the primate of the Estonian Orthodox Church. He was elected 
by the bishops and the priests and the people of Estonia to be their primate according to their law, according to the statute of the Church of Estonia. So after this election, he being a Russian citizen, he got a residence permit. He stayed in Estonia and he was very much respected and loved by the people who belong to the Estonian Orthodox Church and to the other churches because he was very active in inter-religious and inter-Christian dialogue. But suddenly the government told him that since his residence permit was going to expire, they were not going to give him another one, so he had, unfortunately, he had to leave. Uh, the government told him very clearly that in order to change this decision, he has to condemn Patriarch Kirill, who is the primate of the Russian Orthodox Church, and our spiritual father. Metropolitan Evgeny didn't want to do that. Uh, we speak about the country which proclaims herself as belonging to the community of European family, where the rights of human beings and the uh, standards of democracy is something very important which uh, determines the very character of this European family. The thing we see here is a very rude attempt of the government to interfere in, in, in the church issues, which is totally unacceptable. I thank God for the fact that we never face this in Russia, where our church is absolutely free, where we can resolve our inner problems if they arise by ourselves. Unfortunately, what we see now in so-called democratic Europe is a very different uh, picture. What can we do now in order to uh, help the situation? Of course, uh, now we see uh, the reaction of the very Estonian Orthodox Church, of the people who had to say goodbye to their spiritual father, to the Metropolitan, crying with tears in their eyes. We see many voices of the Lutheran priests in Estonia who speak against this decision of the Estonian government. Nobody knows what has happened. Nobody knows what was the, the official reason that uh, uh, the government didn't want to let Metropolitan Evgeny stay there. I believe that it is very important that uh, after all this happened, we continue speaking about that and we continue attracting the attention of the society, of the world society, to what is going on. Because sometimes when people uh, commit crimes like that, and I have no other words to describe what has happened there, because it's the violation uh, uh, of, uh, of the freedom of religion. Sometimes they believe that their decisions will, you know, remain somewhere covered by silence, by absolute silence. So I think we have to speak about that, and we as the Russian Church, we will try to uh, take any attempt uh, to change the situation, to make uh, our church in Estonia free, of any outside influence and to be able to uh, maintain the church life, of course, according to the local Estonian laws, but also uh, according to the church rules which have existed for centuries. Uh, as an organization that stands against uh, any type of persecution, whether that is in Europe or in Africa, Orthodox Unity Beach was concentrating many of its years uh, to report and to make the world known ab know about the persecutions in Africa, as uh, as the Russian Orthodox Church is now involved uh, in the field, and as you know more about the persecution that's happening in Ethiop uh, Ethiopia and Nigeria and other places, we really like to know to what extent Exarchate of uh, Africa under Moscow Patriarchate is helping out, and uh, what all to what extent they are uh, bringing out the the bad phase of persecution that's happening in the other side of the world. Of course, we are fully aware of what is going on in certain countries of Africa regarding the freedom of uh, Christians to express their faith. Just recently, a couple of days ago, we witnessed a terrible murder of Ethiopian monks. Yeah. And uh, 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 on behalf of the Russian Orthodox Church, we have expressed our condolences to the Ethiopian Church on, on what has happened. Uh, we try to do our best to stand together with our brothers and sisters, and sisters sorry, in, uh, in African countries where the Christians are being persecuted. We try to participate as much as we can in different humanitarian programs in order to help the people there, to support them. 
Of course, we speak about this on different levels in, in international organizations, in inter-Christian, inter-religious organizations where the Russian Orthodox Church is present and can raise its voice for that. Also, we try to, atta to attach the attention of, uh, of the Russian government to, the, to this situation so that they would be able to use their diplomatic relations in order to uh, express their um, concern uh, on what is going on. But I think mostly it is important, as we spoke uh, in the very beginning of our conversation, that uh, these uh, problems would never remain in complete silence. We have to do our best in order to speak about this, in order to call white, white, black, black, uh, to speak about the truth and to make other people know what is going on. Because we see that some people, they, they just, just don't know what, what's happening. Uh, they believe that persecution is something that happened with Christianity in the very first centuries of its history. Unfortunately, it's not true. There, there are countries, regions in the world where Christians up to now are being persecuted. So I think as much as we can, we have to speak about that. Not only speak, but as I said, shout. To shout. So that uh, people would know uh, and would raise their voice. And we as Christians believe it's even more important to have their prayers uh, to support their brothers and sisters in these uh, terrible situations. Uh, as, I, as we come move to the concluding part of this particular interview, I really like to know your uh, uh, you are thinking and your thoughts about uh, Orthodox Ecoinity Peace Society, which uh, uh, stands uh, for seeking an united Orthodox Christian witness in this challenging world. First of all, I would like to thank you and all your colleagues for the work that you are doing. Uh, your uh, website is not only a uh, a, uh, a resource from where you can get important news, important information on what's happening in the church, but it, it's also something that helps us to bring bridges in the current world. Uh, this is very important and this is very precious. For this, we are very grateful to you. Uh, we are also very grateful to you for the interest that you have towards the Russian Orthodox Church, speaking uh, about our activities, but mostly speaking about the challenges that we are facing today, especially regarding the issue of the persecution of Christians in Ukraine. So I can say nothing else but the words of gratitude for your work. Uh, we are very thankful to you and uh, I would like to wish to you and to all the people who read everything you write on your website, uh, God's help and uh, all the very best in Christ. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, this particular interview. First of all, I'd like to thank Department of Exchange Relations for uh, setting up this particular interview. And we are, I also like to thank uh, Department of Ecumenical Relations of Malingra Orthodox Church for helping us to uh, move out with this particular interview. Thank you, Metropolitan, once again. Uh, it was a really great time to spend with you. Thank, thank you for you. the invitation. Thank you.